because I'm just going to tell you the story from beginning to end um, without any commentary. I am just going to offer up the information to you as it was offered to me last night while I was doing the research. So there are a couple of different people involved in this case, um, but this case revolves around the Anastasi family, and this really is a story of lust and sex and hatred and jealousy and a lot of bloodshed. So, we're going to start the story by introducing to you a married couple. There was Anne Anastasi, who was 42 at the time, and Anthony Anastasi, who was a 40. Anne was a housewife, a stay-at-home mom. They had five children together. And they lived in Lothian, Maryland, I believe that's how you pronounce it. And the county in Maryland was the Anne Arundel County. Now, Lothian, Maryland was a place that was very, very quiet. It was rural. There wasn't a lot happening. Definitely not a lot of crime. Um, so what you're going to hear right now is something that was like not really heard of in this area. By surprise. So, this all started with a 911 call that was made on October 5th, 2015. And it was a very strange phone call. The person on the other line was very nonchalant, sounded very casual, and it was just weird. So, I'm going to read it to you. The woman who had called 911 said, I just spent the day taking kids to the dentist and then going grocery shopping, and I'm supposed to be leaving to take my husband to a doctor's appointment right now. But he's not responding at all, and he's got a gun lying next to him on the bed. The 911 dispatcher says, do you believe that he shot himself? And she says, I don't know, I didn't turn the lights on in the room. So, in case you have not put it together, this was Anne who had made the 911 call. And police arrived at her door while she was still on the phone making the 911 call. They lived on West Bay Front Road in Lothian, Maryland. And the first thing that authorities noticed when they walked in were there were crates everywhere. It was very cluttered. There were crates of food, crates of laundry. There were just clothes on the floor, some dirty, some clean. Like, it was just very cluttered very unorganized. Later, they just realized that that's just how they lived their life. It doesn't really add anything to the case that much, but that just kind of goes to show you what kind of house they were dealing with. So Anne was very composed. She was almost shy. She did not seem troubled. She didn't seem really phased that her husband had possibly committed suicide. So authorities asked if she could show them where her husband was, so she led them upstairs to her bedroom, and Anthony was lying face up with a bullet wound in his temple. Um, there was a .45 caliber pistol lying just a few inches away from his hand. So right away, it looked like he had shot himself that this was a suicide. And when they examined the wound closely, it was just a single clean wound. And there was something called um, stippling, which is basically, I was trying to research it, it's like a burning that happens in the skin when the muzzle of the gun, like the barrel, is really close to the area that was shot. So basically, it looked very much like a suicide, like a, he had just pointed the gun to his temple and took his life. And she also pointed out to authorities that Anthony had been depressed. So she was then asked who lived in the house because they had to start, you know, filing a suicide report. And she named her five children, most of which were at school that day, except for their 13 year old daughter home sick that day. Um, but besides her five children and her husband, her husband and herself, there was a house guest, she called her, and her name was Jacqueline Riggs. She was 25. 
was a door but there was also a door that led to a stairwell in their house that led to their basement you know like a typical basement um so they asked her is Jacqueline home and she said oh I don't know I haven't heard from her today um she said the last that she had heard of Jacqueline was the night before and had heard Jacqueline and Anthony down in the basement arguing with each other and when he came and met Anne, they like encountered each other in their bedroom. He was very short with her, very gruff, um, and he just told her, take the cats out of the room and go sleep with the kids, and just like kicked her out of their room. So of course, police then had to go check out the basement, see if Jacqueline was home, see if they could find any information. So they go downstairs, and the first thing that they're met with is this ridiculously loud, aggressive, heavy metal music and it was weird because there was no one really moving about in the basement like there was no one there but there was heavy metal music playing and the detectives that were on the case that day said that they that added to the already eerie situation it just made it a lot more creepy and disturbing so after looking around for a couple of minutes or a couple seconds really they saw site. I'm not going to include pictures, but they are on the internet if you wish to see them. I saw them. They're very gruesome. On the middle of a blood-soaked carpet, they found Jacqueline's body basically butchered. She had been stabbed 20 times and slashed 22 times. So she was mutilated basically she was stabbed all over her body legs arms torso stomach neck everywhere um and it was just it was a really really horrible sight there was blood on the floor blood on the walls on the bed she had defense wounds on her hands on her arms it was a horrific crime scene and it was very she fought hard for her life. Then looking around the basement more, they realized that the door had been locked from the outside, so you couldn't enter the basement from using that door. And there were screws in the windowsills, so the windows had been screwed shut. And there was trash everywhere, like overturned trash, just like wrappers, everything, just all over the floor. It was just, it was a very, very, very weird scene. So the sergeant that was on the case, his name was Sergeant Poole, and he said that all of this was pointing to a murder-suicide. So of course now they had to try to do more investigating to maybe see why, why he did it, what happened. So the investigation that followed over the next couple of days changed everything. This is where their theory of the murder-suicide just went out the window. So in investigating the house more, and investigating the actual bedroom of Anthony, they found a bombshell, like a casing of a bullet. And it was from .45 caliber, right? Which is what was um, the gun that was near his, near his hand that had been placed there. Then they retrieved a particle out of his temple was actually still in him, and that was a .380 bullet. Long story short, the bullet that was in his head did not match the bullet casing and the gun that was placed near his hand. And they tested it. They took the bullet from his head, like the same, the same bullet, 
his kids respected and loved him and were very, very close with him. So the detective just pointed out, you know, it depended on who you asked. If you asked Anne, he was a horrible man. If you asked his kids, he was a great man. It just depended on who you spoke to. But this is where Jacqueline comes in. So while his kids loved him, so did Jacqueline. She was very attached to him as well. So here's how they met her. For a brief period of time, the family actually lived in Michigan, and that's where they met Jacqueline. And to put it lightly, Anne, Anthony, and Jacqueline started up a three-way romantic relationship. And um, Anne had reported that there was some intimate, you know, physical contact, but after the first time, you know, she, she said that she didn't like it and she refused to do it again. Well, she didn't want to do it. Anthony did. And he insisted. He wanted this three-way relationship to keep going. When they moved to Maryland, he literally just told Anne, I'm moving Jacqueline into the house. She's moving to Maryland and she's going to live in the basement apartment. Anne didn't really get a say. And after a time of her living in the house with him and his family, they basically, the threesome turned into a twosome, and Anne found herself the odd person out, and detectives asked her, do you believe that Jacqueline and your husband were fooling around, and she said, I know they were, and they said, how do you know, and she said that there were many, many nights where he would spend the night downstairs with the basement door locked and wouldn't come up until the next day. So, um, that kind of paints that relationship there for you. So, after all the questioning, oh, well, actually, they asked her, they said, well, did you ever confront him about this? And she said that she did, and he basically just said, if you don't like it, you can get out of my house. You can leave. And she didn't want to leave her kids. So she says that's why she put up with it. So, again, Anne was very cooperative. She agreed to a gunpowder test where they, you know, test your clothes and your, your skin for any gunpowder residue. They swab your cheeks for DNA. She handed over her cell phone and she agreed to a polygraph test where she was very calm. She didn't seem phased or nervous at all. Down the hall was a different story where a 13-year-old daughter was. She... Her name was never given, and her face is always blurred because she's a minor. She was very, very young. She was 13 years old. Um, so I don't have a name for her, but she was very traumatized by the death of her father. She was very, very close to him. She was very erratic, they said. She tried to run out of the building at one point during the investigation. She was just, she was a mess. Um, but like I said before, she was very close with her dad, and she reported that she had one day overheard her dad and Jacqueline talking about possibly having a child together, and so that resulted in a lot of jealousy and rage on her part. She also handed over her phone to authorities, just like her mother did. So, a couple days go by. All of the tests are processed, and Anne is brought back in to the authorities to go over the test results. I'm just going to read you this conversation because I, I watched it because the, the investigation was recorded. So the detective says, there are a couple of things I need to clear up real quick. The test that they took from your clothes and your hands, well, they were all sent off. And Anne goes probably found lots of cat milk on there. He says, well, we found a lot of gunshot residue on you and on your clothes. She goes, really? That's weird. Then later, he says, you have a failed polygraph test. You did not just fail it, you flunked the hell out of it. He then points out that the gun in her husband's head did not match the gun that was placed near his hand. There were more evidence so they were looking at her phone records, and that night at 3 a.m., so 3 a.m. the same day that she called the police, there was a phone call with her 13-year-old daughter. It lasted for 582 seconds, which is about 10 minutes. And she's trying to 
she shouldn't have moved into my house. What did she think was going to happen? Basically, you know, it, that made their case much, much stronger because they heard her and, you know, phone calls and jails are recorded for this very reason. Um, so it was very clear that she had very bad intentions towards Jacqueline and that was pretty much all authorities needed to hear. I don't even think she got her trial. Like, that was it. After that phone call, it was very clear um, that she did it. Her 13-year-old daughter went to a juvenile facility. She will be eligible for release at 21 years old, so I believe she has four years left. She should be 17 now, around 17. The other two, Gabriel and Anne, have two life sentences in jail with all but 60 years suspended, but they have two life sentences, so you know, authorities said that they, they highly doubt that they'll ever step foot out of a jail for the rest of their lives. Um, and now I'm going to read you a quote from the county police spokeswoman, Jacqueline Davis. She said, we have two people dead. We have three in jail. We have four children who lost both parents and a sibling, all because of lust and sex and love and hatred. Um, which is very true. And in case you were wondering, Anne's family, or Anne's remaining children, went to live with Anthony's family, um, and they're doing okay. You know, they're, they're doing as well as you can expect, and I'm pretty sure that the children were young, younger than 13. Um, so, it's a lot for young kids to do with, for sure. So, that is all the information I have. It's a very horrible story, and I mean isn't one person who I blame more than others. You know, everyone was guilty of something. Anthony should not have brought a woman, another woman, to live in the house with his family. Like, if he wanted to be with this woman and didn't want to be with his wife anymore. I mean, I don't condone this either, but wouldn't it be better to ask for a divorce, you know? You know, and, and Jacqueline's 25. She may be young, but I'm younger than that, and I even know getting involved with someone who is in another relationship, married or not, never a good idea, especially if you're going to go live with them. Um, and obviously, I don't have to tell you why she was wrong. Gabriel, troubled kid, but yet he brutally, brutally murdered two people. The 13-year-old, she's young. Maybe she doesn't really know better yet. Maybe her mom brainwashed her. And she just got really unlucky with the mom that she was given. Um, but obviously she she was in the wrong too. You can't not blame her, you know. Um, it's just a very sad and very unfortunate story. I feel bad for the rest of their family. And Gabriel actually wrote one of the, I think it was the spokeswoman of the police department, a letter saying, you know, how horrible he feels and how you know, he hopes that one day the family can forgive him, and, you know, just, it, it, he, he does feel very bad. Not gonna make a difference, because he still has two life sentences. But at least he's not like Anne, who was just, like, indifferent.